Um, welcome to uh, what is concurrent delay. Um, Henry will be taking the session this morning. Thank you all for joining. Um, and don't forget to look out, we've got quite a few online seminars and lots of talking heads coming up. So keep an eye out for the announcements of those um, and keep yourself informed. Um, I will hand straight over to Henry. Good morning, Mr. Hathaway. Yeah, okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much. Uh, just following on from our early seminar as well, the same topic. And generally what we will find is over the last number of weeks that while a lot of the conversations has been discussing and describing about the effect of coronavirus and has been certainly relating to whether it's a force majeure or frustration event or what the rights and remedies are under any particular contract, um, one of the key things that does come up quite a lot is because of the suddenness um, of uh, the events that have unfolded on many and have impacted many construction contracts throughout is if there is an event um, of which is the employer's delay or if there is an event which uh, a contractor is concurrently in delay, what is the effect? Now, this is a topic that has often uh, been brought up and it's been discussed and it's become quite relevant as well. Um, certainly with a lot of projects uh, having to go into abeyance or suspension or certainly how do we deal with time? <clears throat> so the last two weeks we, were, we had talked quite a lot about the, especially under JCT, about the relevant events, relevant matters and the persistence of the actual uh, conditions themselves and what they are. But again, concurrency has always been one of those events and one of those instances that has always created quite a lot of contention. Um, and it continues to happen now and it's become very much to the forefront now as to how it's uh, to be dealt with, how it occurs. I think that one of the main points as well is to realize when it is actually occurring what it is that um, have we actually triggered such an event is it actually right and what do we do about that and what we'll see throughout the course of this lecture is like how the standard forms will actually treat it um, what actually is the uh, conditions what's the mechanisms under any particular contract and if the particular mechanisms aren't there what is the sensible or the reasonable way of dealing with it? And invariably how the courts deal with these issues, both historic and what we would expect in the future. So running through on the different instances, um, what is concurrent delay, the starting point? Essentially, it's usually one delay event is at the employer's risk, whereas the other is, is the contractor's. The delays may be simultaneous or simply overlap. The contractors will often raise concurrent delay as a defense to liquidate damages being levied by the employer. So essentially we're, we're into a time position here at this moment and what we often find when we talk in a pragmatic sense and all of these instances of how they present it is generally when there is a competing cause, if you like, and one of the real uh, terms that gets mentioned and will be mentioned throughout this particular lecture is actually causation. Uh, a breach or an event has occurred, otherwise the both concurrent, how do we treat those? But they happen in different formats and it's the matter of being alive to when it actually occurs. So if I take the example, clearly, when a contractor, as a main contractor, uh, undertakes the contract works, if there are certain events with an employer, then arguably, you know, they are that little bit identifiable or they ought to be. The difficulty can come about really when we have contractors and subcontractors and we have many different interactions, we have many different uh, coordination and cooperation points as well they can be actually quite a little bit more subtle and not always are they dealt with uh, correctly. Invariably, they, they, these points come down to behaviors as well. When we actually see that, um, you know, time is becoming quite short, uh, programs are resequenced, readjusted, 
the key point about all of these instances is understanding what did the parties agree at the time of contract? What did they actually uh, understand? What was crystallized? Because in any dispute, as we've always mentioned, that when a dispute occurs, the starting point is to go to the point of what did the parties intend at the time of contract and how do we measure against that? This is actually no different in that respect either. So if we look at how the standard forms a contract actually deal with these points, like you know, we've got the JCT major project, a construction contract aside, neither the JCT nor the NEC standard forms provide for any mechanism with a concurrent delay procedure. And there's a number of different points with it because it's quite a difficult um, area. We're going into very much base points of causation, as we mentioned as well. <clears throat> and it is a question of causation. But just because the, neither the JCT nor the NEC deal expressly with the point of concurrency because they go back to their base rules uh, of the first principle approach, it doesn't mean that parties don't use the time try to tender, certainly before the contract period, to crystallize the contract at that particular time to actually address the issue. So while we'll discuss uh, one of the leading cases that actually did do so, what the effects were later on, what is critically important is to understand, well, if we do know that this is an event that can occur within our projects, it does repeat itself as an issue, like many other issues, is there an opportunity that as a business that we can actually realize that there is a foreseeable issue in now or in the future that there could be a concurrency or there could be um, these events that could uh, uh, emanate and what therefore is our response to it and how do we actually reach those agreements should such an event actually occur. But by contrast, 8.5 of 2017 editions of the FIDIC box, it says, if a delay caused by a matter which is the employer's responsibility is concurrent with a delay caused by a matter which is the contractor's responsibility, the contractor's entitlement to an extension of time shall be assessed in accordance with the rules and procedures stated in the special provisions, if not stated as appropriate, taken due regard to all relevant circumstances. <clears throat> so yes, it does address, but on any given pragmatic application, it doesn't really tell you much further. But again, like any standard form, the parties are free to agree from the outset, what do we think would be a rational or what do we think could be a, an opportunity to address this issue? Because if the event does occur, we certainly have those mechanisms in place. So therefore, I, we would actually suggest that there is an opportunity for the parties. It does reoccur and the onus becomes on uh, entities to discover, reflect firstly what happened in the past when an issue of concurrency arose and separately what is the best way to deal with these and to incorporate those within conditions or ex simply express terms of any particular contract. But looking back at the FIDIC, uh, even the wording. Um, ultimately, this, these are points that the facts will turn on themselves. The causation, like the, the breach itself, the causation and the losses alleged, be it time or indeed money. Um, if money can become one of those uh, heads of claim. And nothing is there to suggest that it can't be dealt with. So, when we actually talk about, if we now have a position by which that, say, the JCT doesn't actually address concurrency, one of the next points that one would always look towards, well, is there an implied position uh, in respect of what the party should do? Now, implied terms are usually those to explain. We might actually suggest, well, laws are implied in the contract. They're incorporated. Some are enabled, so you can't contract out of. Um, but say, for example, with the Health and Safety Work Act, nobody it will be implied as a matter of uh, term into the contract, although it may not be expressly stated. One would not like to be printing off every copy of every legislation and therefore printing them off, incorporating them into the contract, it would make uh, little sense. And so terms can be implied. 
But on the instance that there was nothing there to look towards, we then look towards the courts because we uh, operate in a common law jurisdiction. Um, so therefore, if there has been a decision or an authority uh, that has been decided through the courts, depending on the, uh, what court it is, uh, all decisions and authorities are binding on those lower courts below. What we actually can then do is we can rely on those, as we would call, precedents. So, one of the main points is, what did the courts say? So the courts in England and Wales have not been altogether clear on the subject. And that's not a criticism at all, because the courts generally on this issue, they will go to the points of the breach, causation, etc., and they will examine in the facts. They will examine what are the course of events. So the hard and fast rules to suggest, well, in every single instance, this must occur. They will investigate, and of course, that will come down to uh, evidence. It will come down to the type of records. It will come down to the proof. It will come down to has the burden of proof on the claimant and has the um, balance of probabilities been met to argue upon that point. But for the best part of the last century, the courts examined whether an event was dominant or proximate cause of delay. One early example of this comes in the form of the House of Lords in Leyland Shipping. Lord Shaw stated, proximate cause is an expression referring to the efficiency as an operating factor upon the result. Where various factors or causes are concurrent, one has to be selected, the matter is determined as one of fact, and the choice falls upon one to which may be variously ascribed the qualities, reality, predominance, and efficiency. And even then, when we actually look towards what was um, suggested afterwards, the dominant cause approach was increasingly viewed as artificial at that point in 2011. Um, it often seemed arbitrary to choose one from among several competing causes, rendering the others immaterial. It was confirmed in 2011. But the comments, uh, a useful working definition of concurrent delay in this context is a period of project overrun, which is caused by two or more effective causes of delay, which are approximately equal cause of potency. So that word causative, causation comes into play as well, and how it could be actually treated. And these are the type of uh, points that when we look towards drafting uh, originally uh, before the, uh, the parties enter into those agreements with the hope that they incorporate those terms. And um, certainly what we're trying to do is we're trying to minimize the liabilities. We're trying to provide clarity and lack of ambiguity given the actual specific nature of the projects. But certainly the dominant cause. So if we're to talk about the dominant cause, the dominant cause is one of those that most likely than not, um, that was the one that was most dominant, of course, that led to the overriding or the overall delay itself. It was more dominant. Now, the point to say that it often seemed arbitrary to choose one from another. Again, we're going into the effect of causation, et cetera. But of course, we have to understand as well that like, now, if a dispute has arisen, both parties are competing at that point. Uh, it's adversarial in some instances, and essentially, it's very much to say on the balance which party would be right in terms of a liability. And then liability would have to be addressed in this instance as well, of course, but to say which it is before we go into the extent of whatever type of delay. But one, it's not unnatural to suggest or even see in arguments when an employer will often suggest, well, of course, it's more dominant. Uh, you know, the contractor's delay is more dominant than mine. Or the contractor will say, well, of course, it's more dominant uh, in position of where the, um, of a contractor delay. And that can lead to the actual dispute actually intensifying about those different points because Regardless of the objective nature that ought to be applied, it's very difficult for parties in that instance to apply that objective test for that because it's quite, it's quite real to each of the parties. But even then, when we look towards to say, you know, Henry Boot construction, the Court of Appeal held 
If there are two concurrent causes of delay, one of which is a relevant event and the other is not, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time for the period of delay caused by a relevant event, notwithstanding the concurrent effect of the other event. What, where is this now? This is now progressing. Now, there have often been numerous different attempts to actually try and deal with the element of uh, concurrency. We had the but for approach. This was one that the contractors often liked. But for your um, delayed, but for your event, and this would have occurred. This would we would have been able to, or you know, and it, it resolves around that. It's it's not desperately um, seen as uh, the most prevalent. The next uh, attempt was something of the order of where it was a first in line approach. Uh, now this caused problems because if the first in line, uh, the first cause of the delay are essentially responsible for all subsequent, regardless. Um, and there's difficulty with that because now we're into the dominant, it offends, it goes against what the dominant cause would be on that. Um, but as well, it doesn't tell that true state of affairs. And the true state of affairs can only be established when we look at the issues of the first principles between breach, causation, and losses, and to actually distinguish and to work through those points. But inherently, we're now suggesting in this particular case, that it was a court of appeal, if there are two concurrent causes of delay, one of which is a relevant event, the other is not. So the relevant event can only be by the employer. Essentially, it's a breach, but Many parties will not use such terms because there, are, is a re, there is an adequate redress under the contract, which provides that if a relevant event is provided for, then the subsequent or, uh, extensions, reasonable extensions of time, are provided to the adjustment to the completion date. But it's suggesting if a relevant event did occur, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time for the period of delay caused by the relevant event, notwithstanding the concurrent event of the other event, i.e. its own position. This, of course, would be quite popular with um, certainly contractors. Now, there's always been that tension amongst which, you know, we've had different cases in relation to where the dominant cause would become popular and all of those instances we have, 2001, we'll move very shortly on to 2000 well, where it was addressed in Walter Lilly versus Mackay, that famous case. But essentially, that, that underwriting point, there have been papers released by the Society of Construction Law, and while it doesn't expressly support a certain mechanism, it was viewed that this approach did gather quite a lot of discussion. Um, so in in most instances that the point of addressing concurrency for those who are aware is actually to approach it from those different tests perhaps um, you know does it uh, on any given set of circumstances or tests has the uh, reasonings under the dominant court has that been given good weight or is it more suitable or what are the arguments or the application so therefore, you would set up alternative arguments in any of those instances against the particular test themselves. So where there are two causes of project delay, one at the risk of the employer, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time over a period that those delays overlap. This does not, however, mean the contractor can recover loss and expense, and that is important on those points because we're now talking about time particularly. So it doesn't give an automatic rise you would simply have to argue your position much more separately and distinctly in re relation to section four or in re uh, considering what the loss and expense would be. But in the wake of Mamison, some believe the more flexible approach should be taken in respect of concurrent delay in circumstances where blame could be apportioned between the parties fairly and reasonably taking into consideration the culpability and significance of each delay. So now we're moving, we're, we're talking now in terms of like, no, the, the, the point of view of looking at the facts, looking at what the cause of delay and certainly what is the real answer, what is the current state of affairs. Now, this always turns on its own, what is the type of evidence, what is the ability to prove. And again, this is an argument on the balance of probabilities. We must meet that test to have any 
uh, highlight or chance at all relating to this. There was persuasive authority from Scotland. Now, when we say persuasive authority, what we actually mean is Scotland is a different jurisdiction uh, than England and Wales. When a case is decided and, uh, in Scotland, it's not binding on the English courts, but certainly if we get to the point where there is good reasoning, it's been established away throughout, it can be seen as being persuasive, maybe not binding. But this was the position and city in. Apportionment was not, has not really caught on. And then we move on to 2012 with Walter Lilly, Mr. Justin Aikenhead. And he says, I'm clearly of the view that where there is an extension of time clause such as that agreed upon in this case and where delay is caused by two or more effective causes, one of which entitles a contractor to an extension of time has been a relevant event, the contractor is entitled to a full extension of time. The fact that the architect has to award a fair and reasonable extension does not imply that there should be some apportionment in the cause of case of current delays. The test is primarily a causation one. It therefore follows that although persuasive weight, the city in case is in, inapplicable within this jurisdiction. So that throws quite a, a very much a, a point onto it. And it deals with city in. But again, you'll probably notice as well that we have the word causation. And this is the, the point. So we're now returning to an instance and the recommendation that I'd be suggesting to anybody in this thing would be, these are typical events. They repeat quite often. The ability to recognize it's actually occurring is key. And that's one of the first points. And if we realize to ourselves, well, this is something that we've always had to maintain. And we look at the last five projects that we've been dealing with, and it's always been an issue. Well, now is the time to say, well, we, it's foreseeable that we'll be an issue in the future. So what are the different things that we can do? There is absolutely nothing wrong with a party agreeing with different points of apportionment or how they see fit. Uh, and as long as they are workable, free from ambiguity and clear. But again, the key sense of causation, again, that word raises. And we are looking at the breach, the understanding and the evidence. These are matters on terms of what the quality of the evidence, the quality of the events, record keeping becomes incredibly important. Now, I realize that I will always refer back to Ebert Hemsom on his points about the importance of records. This doesn't change. It really becomes those, uh, especially if it's something on an adjudication where matters are based on paper evidence primarily very rarely will there be meetings or face-to-face. -face. Um, so therefore, the, those contemporary points of evidence becomes incredibly important. <clears throat> what the above authorities have confirmed is the party should deal expressly with concurrent delay in their contracts. Now this is a case, the next case, North Midland building in 2018, is a clear example of how the parties attempted to deal with the point of concurrency um, in relation to the operation of the contract. What was actually uh, very important when we consider is that the parties did attempt to agree, no doubt about it. Second of all, why therefore did it get to the Court of Appeal if what we said is that there was agreement in place? These type of clauses, as was the case, uh, are very, very common in um, development contracts or between a developer and a contractor. And essentially, the, the underlying intent behind this clause was this, that they had drafted a clause which stated that if a delay occurs where there's a contention, essentially, that it is a concurrent delay, all of the risk of that concurrency will be transferred onto the contractor. So therefore, there will be no uh, instance of relevant events or there will be no instance of extension of time. And essentially then that the benefit of say any liquidated damages, for example, at that point 
will become actually the right to be levied upon by the uh, employer. The reasoning why that came uh, to such an extent to the Court of Appeal was actually the, I suppose, the fairness that uh, they suggested, because there is what's called a prevention principle, and any of those listening would have often heard me discuss and describe the prevention principle, especially when we talk about condition precedents or time bars. But essentially, what the court said was that there was the, free from ambiguity, the, the words were clear, um, that is what the parties had agreed expressly. So it's not so much, and this really as well highlights a point as well, that when parties enter into terms expressly, the court will give effect if they're free and they are workable. It's not a matter at that stage whether it doesn't suit a party any longer, or in fact that they might say, well, it's now a bad bargain. The purpose of the courts here is not to make a bad bargain a good one. They're there to give effect to what the parties actually agreed. So in this case, the Court of Appeal upheld a contractual clause that precluded a contractor from claiming extension time during periods of concurrent delay, and for those very reasons I've set out. So while they may not have agreed on the result of the operation of the clause, certainly the operation of the clause was there, it was agreed at the time of contract, and it did survive. There is nothing stopping parties with actually agreeing these points first up, either by a mechanism or about what type of evidence or about how it's to be treated. All I would suggest is that such drafting would be very, very clear and unambiguous. Then moving on, then if we look towards, well, float. Float often gets brought up in many, many different conversations. And we know that flow contractors often allow for some float in a project in order to absorb delays for which they're unable to claim an extension at time, perhaps. And it provides a cushion to absorb the negative effects of a delay, including delay damages or liquidated damages. The real issue now comes about is to say, well, how is float treated? We've often had instances where a contractor will not want to really, I suppose, disclose or certainly advertise the amount of float that they do have in a certain um, program for this very reason, for this very fear. Um, because how is it treated? On one hand, the contractor under JCT might suggest, well, under the strict operation of the JCT, you've given me a a uh, commencement date, you have given me a completion date, isn't it right that I'm allowed to organize and sequence my works as I see fit as long as I carry out the contract works to the specification and to the contract in the given timeline? That's pretty much what we have agreed. In fact, when we go a little bit to conversely onto the argument, which has actually been very much um, on the other side, is that if a contractor decides we are doing exceptionally well on this project, we in fact, we think we can finish two to three months earlier, what we're going to do is we're going to ask the employer and request the employer to start pushing forward on any information that we need so that we can meet our foreshortened program. We certainly will benefit from any savings ourselves, and of course that's the case. But what we do know about those points is that the employer has no underlying ob obligation to foreshorten the overall point so as just to assist the contractor to get to those points. So this now leads into where float comes about, how it's treated. And what we find is when the employer tries to avail itself of the float, perhaps by instructing a variation with granting extension of time, when the contractor seeks an extension of time, despite the delaying event not causing critical delay, such cases, the contractor argues, they should have, been, should have had an extension of time to preserve the float incorporated into the program in the first place. In both cases, employers will state no extension of time is needed as the float can absorb the delay. This stance arises out of the mindset that an employer has paid for float within the contract price and should therefore be able to derive that benefit. Hence the tension. And we also have very clear, and I've come across many cases 
where the employer has taken such an approach where they might be in delay themselves, but suggest, well, there is the float within the project that the contractor had developed in at the outset in the baseline, it releases those points, uses up that float only for the contractor to later go in to uh, further delays. And having lost the benefit of any points that they would have said before with the, uh, with the float. And that's certainly where the tension, we've always seen those tensions arise. And there is always those uh, tensions, and they do. Again, there is always those aspects that parties can agree how is float to be treated or how is. Because otherwise, we are now into the uh, instance where we uh, critically have to say to ourselves, what we are dealing with is ambiguity and certainly tensions. But how does a contractor respond to what the employer said? The float has been built into the program to afford the flexibility and protection against these type of unforeseen delays, but they should be our unforeseen delays, not the employer. It does not exist to enable the employer to avoid granting a valid request for an extension of time. A contractor should be afforded the right, they say, to freely manage its sequencing in the time of, uh, of its activities to avoid incurring delay damages or liquidate damage by completing the works. And certainly there is very persuasive laws and authorities that support. But there's very few judgments that address this point. In the case of ASCON, um, in this case, the main contractor held that they had the benefit of the float built into the contract with the employer, attempted to claim an extension of time arising out of the subcontractor delay. This delay was totally absorbed by the main contract flow, but the contractor claimed on the basis that it did not exist. The contractor was prevented from recovering its hypothetical loss from the subcontractor because of benefit from the float under the main contract. This has led to the interpretation of float as a resource to be used in a first come for serve basis, irrespective of the cause of the delay. So, but going back to the first paragraph, there's very much like, you know, when we see words like hypothetical loss, because you have to prove your loss and all of those, and privity of contract. Again, those where the tensions arise, this is one of the key cases why I do like because it really uh, highlights the instance when there is a main contract which has its own set of conditions and operations and obligations and how they step down. And of course, then this becomes a very large problem. It's not unusual that a contractor will actually provide various different programs. They will actually provide one program for their, what they will call their own target. They will provide one uh, to the employer and they will produce sometimes a very foreshortened one uh, for, for use with subcontractors, nearly as an act to to motivate or to sort of to bring forward and to condense the works of the subcontractors as much as possible while giving them. The principles are still the same. And um, what basically the contractor is doing in this instance is creating a buffer. But it's saying that it's the first come first of basis. What I'd like to suggest is that the when we look at those points and it can often be said, and I know that NEC has always had the ethos behind, but realistically, it ought to be the project that owns the float. Now, this doesn't set aside from any different points, like you know, that if we are talking about NEC, about key dates or access dates being compensation events, and indeed with the JCT, that if the this is where the detail of the first starting baseline comes across the amount of detail when information is required or access, all of those instances, those rights still persist. But that float to get to that point, and it's only with the necessary detail having stepped through, but inherently, it is an arguable point. So how is float deal dealt with? And I still suggest that at the time. This is a continuing exercise. It's a continuing point that gets raised again and again when we look towards disputes. So therefore, if it's going to be recurring, it's foreseeable that it is an issue. The principal question that must form on everybody's mind is to suggest, if we do revisit this issue again and again, what are the right ways to deal with this moving forward? 
But if we turn again to Fiddick as an example of standard form, of what, what it suggests about float, the red, yellow, and silver book state that the contractor owns the float and is entitled to an extension of time where the planned completion date is delayed irrespective of any available float. Then again, it is prudent for parties to deal with the float expressly when negotiating. So techniques in terms of, of, the, of either the hypothetical or actual impact of a delay. Choosing the correct method is important when seeking to favor the court. Jefford, just as Jefford emphasized, such evidence have to actually assist the court. One thing delay analysis cannot replace, however, is accurate records. We go back to Abrahamson, which has always suggested this, the importance of records, the importance of records, the importance of records. The quality of those records, what's been recorded, does it follow the form, does it follow the actual purpose, what is it there to demonstrate? This is an industry that's awash with massive amounts of paper and data. And regardless of all those points, it can be quite difficult. And that's the training and that's the actual uh, concentration on what we're trying to prove and then supplementing with the necessary evidence. Because in, in Skanska, uh, it was stated that even sophisticated delay analysis is only as good as the data put in. And because now we're talking about retrospective or prospective. And certainly the coaching that would be put forward with many different uh, uh, companies or clients in relation to how these instances are dealt with on a current position as we go through the course of events. If there is a delay on any point, then we must consider, do we now look to form a window analysis of that actual particular delay? Do we start recording the instances of delays? How do they affect the program? How do they affect the float? How do they affect, is there a concurrency point? All too often, these are all matters that are dealt with after the event near the final account. It's long been said that these issues all become to a head when we, look at, when we look at the trends and patterns of disputes into the final third of any given project. The question therefore must be why they not dealt with as they occur and understanding what impacts they have because only then we can actually understand what we must do to alleviate those threats. Contractors tend to use prospective assessments and clearly as well that when we look at NEC, NEC certainly does look towards the prospective points, um, but they can be undertaken as a, on a theoretical basis. Um, no doubt about it that certainly if we do take it on a prospective basis, we must be actually looking at the back analysis then of when the events actually occur. So it's actually a forward pass and backward pass as to what was the predicted versus what was the actual and how do we actually update those points because otherwise it becomes theoretical. But no doubt about it that if we're looking at respective, retrospective delay analysis, and this was actually a case that when we look at the distinguishing points about how NEC treats it and how the court now that we see, and that's my certainly solution to it because retrospective delay analysis has the benefit once the quality of the information is there and the causation issues dealt with and pleaded correctly, that we are now dealing with something that has actually occurred. We can state quite categorically with the good contemporary evidence, we can actually now reach that balance and pass that balance of probabilities test. But when we look at 2017 case, the court confirmed that a retrospective analysis was generally preferred because due to the benefit of hindsight and the certainty afforded. Again, that will depend on the quality. What's all the more surprising is that the former contract was NEC3, which expressly requires prospective analysis. The judge concluded, why should I shut my eyes and grope in the dark when the material is available to show what work they actually did and how much it cost them? The judge in this instance simply was not going to ignore the contemporary points or not follow form. He wanted actual substance. He wanted to actually say, well, how accurate is that? 
I don't think that judge was actually going against us, but what he was actually testing here was the quality of evidence. That if there is a perspective point of view given forward on a wholly theoretical basis, when clearly the evidence as to how it was impacted or how it was performed is clearly different, shouldn't that be open to uh, interrogation? Shouldn't we be looking at what the real state of affairs? And with all of these type of cases, the way we look at these and certainly the way we treat them with clients, what we then introduce is, are these type of backward passes and forward passes that if we are going prospectively on a delay, and this is quite clear because in some instances we get parties to say, well, we're supposed to give our program for delays um, impacting uh, against the just the completion date, simply put, we don't know how long it's going to take. Well, that's where the backward and forward pass takes into place, that when it's IELTS executed or retrospective, that it ties in and it can be actually updated as it goes through. So there's a lot of sympathy here for what Judge actually said, but it's not a condemnation, perhaps. It's about accuracy about what the true state of affairs was. It therefore follows that the courts are likely to prefer retrospective analysis on the basis that it uses actual data, therefore neither theoretical nor arbitrary. It's so always though, choosing the correct method will be driven by the information available because <clears throat> I want to take an example. I've described and discussed a window analysis earlier on and what the use around specific delay events. And certainly we have time slice analysis as well. Um, but what we have now is we have impacted versus as planned analysis is very simple and inexpensive method of delay analysis, which involves looking at the hypothetical impact of certain future delay events on a baseline program. The cumulative impact of these future events is then assumed to be critical delay on the project. For obvious reasons, this method is seen as too simplistic to be useful in most situations. The problem is, if we don't have a very decently populated or accurate as planned, and we're now impacting something that's wholly wrong or could never have worked, even the sequencing could be wrong, what level of trust or what level of position can we now impact an as planned that was already wrong? Our baseline and our base assumptions could really be jeopardized. So I wanted to take that example. Clearly, there are six methods that we employ, each raise up in certain levels of sophistication. More specific criticisms of this method are levied on the basis that it fails to demonstrate the cause and effect to deal with contractor delays. Where an employer risk causes delay, which affects a critical path, then an employer acting reasonably should grant a contractor an extension of time. This on the basis, contractor submits clear and reasoned information in a timely fashion. So there we have it. Um, going through, the key points that I would like for party or people to actually see, fundamentally, is one of the words, causation. We've seen it in the judgments. As to whether what approach would be used to concurrency, I think the first starting point is to realize it's actually occurring. What type of approach? There are a lot of instances where there have been variances on the approaches um, quite alive to the different debates that continuously go through. What all of these cases have told us um, is that it is very much of the order. The facts will turn on themselves. The courts aren't interested in arbitrary or hypothetical points of view. If it's available to the parties that a certain course of events has occurred, events did happen, you should attach your mind to those and bring it into the point of causation. Following that, that then takes a very, very distinct application as to how the recording actually occurs. The correspondence, all of those events that run through. And that's before we actually even suggest or get to the point where we might even think that there's a relevant matter or money in that instance. Okay, good morning and thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Henry, for that. Um, there are a couple of questions, Henry, if you could just answer those um, regarding the first one was um, under JCT, if it is considered that the contractor owns the float, against which program do we correctly assess EOT claims, given that the contractor can resequence works in their updated programs 
for their benefit of maximising the length of the EOT claim. Sorry, Joe, I'm just trying to bring up some questions there at the moment. If the contractor's programme is included in the JCT contract, is the employer's position any stronger when it comes to assessment of EOTs? Okay, right. Yeah, okay. So inherently, uh, the later forums, 2016 versions, uh, do, uh, especially in the SBC, do make reference to critical path, etc. But it doesn't go into, even in NEC, NEC it gives out prescriptive points uh, in respect of, say, what is to be contained in the program. I've always amended that to ensure that it shows further detail, as long as the parties buy into it, of course. Um, so, in this instance, we are now talking about the persuasiveness. If we have a point where a contractor submits a program under JCT, and it's only required, it's not a contract document, but if a contractor puts forward a, a program within two weeks or it's a, whatever state of affairs at the very instance, which is the baseline, and the only point that it ever put down was access date, on whatever date, and then completion date underneath it, in theory, that is suffices for a program. So you might have three bars on that. The question is, how persuasive is it? How does it help, or how does it fit, or how does it give that type of intent? It doesn't help very, very much. So we're on a spectrum, and if you view evidence like a spectrum, you have very, very poor evidence to back up a point like I've just described, or you could have a very detailed element of it where you set out your resources, you set all of those, and I realize a lot of contractors are very sensitive about that information. But the point about it is, can it help an employer that later after the event, that a contractor has not held itself to certain events and with no clear explanation or rights under the contract to amend those, it is an evidential point that they are clearly entitled to ask the question to say, you did say, set this out, you did put this forward, there is no excuse, there is no explanation under any reasons under the contract. So therefore, it is contributing to an evidential point, of course, yes. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so that's answered both those questions, I believe, that, uh, that explanation. Under JCT, um, or where the, sorry, there's no one just come in, Henry. Where the contract does not address concurrent delay, has there been any established case law in respect of loss and expense in concurrent? This can okay. be a significant cost, but the focus seems more on EOT. Yeah. Okay. So in that terms, like, no, the reasoning is that time and money are distinctly split in two separate sections of the JCT. Um, so inherently, um, concurrency is a time issue. It does not preclude uh, the sense that uh, a relevant matter or time, if you like. So, uh, but it would have to be argued separately and distinctly. So on the point where you would get an extension of time, you would then have to, to bring a claim in terms of a relevant matter, you will then have to establish that you meet one of the establishing or liability points as a relevant matter. So it very much depends on the circumstance. So we might have neutral events. We might have one where the contractor gets time but no money, for example. Um, like no one, we've talked about force majeure quite a lot over the last number of weeks where it certainly wouldn't be a relevant matter. But if the grounds do exist, it just needs to be pleaded separately and distinctly and proved to balance on its own rights. But if it were to fail from the outset on a liability point, well, then the quantum doesn't really come into play. So it's very much a matter of what is the actual point. So, but inherently, it's not precluded automatically. There's nothing to suggest. In some instances, it may not apply, but it very much depends, of course, yeah. Okay, that's great, Henry. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you to everyone for logging in. As I say, the CPD certificates will be out to you uh, shortly. And um, we have uh, more seminars this afternoon, a lot more seminars planned. So check out the website for the online seminar schedule. And we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.